Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for the warm introduction, Antonio, and I'm also grateful to follow Mike. I think you will find some useful intersections, overlaps, even contradictions between some of what we're offering. And my goal for this is to share some thoughts and provocations that will be beneficial to you over the next few days, and also offer some concrete recommendations of things to not do, and also some suggestions of things to do as we navigate this overwhelming, exciting, and challenging world of AI and education. Here's a, a map of where we'll be going today. I'm going to share with you a little bit um, about myself and the provocations I just mentioned. I will also give an overview of the AI Pedagogy Project, which I lead. Uh, it's based at Harvard, but it's a public resource, and invite all of you to join, contribute, and use it as much as you can, and then ending with some pitfalls and recommendations. My work spans fairly broadly from AI research to art and design to education, and I'll be mostly talking about my AI research and education, but I'm also going to share a little bit of my art with you. Um, I come from an art and philosophy background, and I believe that interdisciplinarity, mixed backgrounds, and diversity are hugely important right now in this time of AI. Um, we do not only want folks who are um, schooled in one field, but rather a broad selection of folks contributing to and engaging with um, not just how the technologies work, but the conversations about how we want them to work or how we want them to govern the world or not. My AI research started about 10 years ago. I really came to AI through the ethics door. As I said, my background is in philosophy. And um, as we started to see machine learning used for things like policing, um, credit scoring, um, other types of things that could have specific harms to humans, um, my team from the Data Nutrition Project and I said, well, why don't we interrogate this training data? This is becoming more relevant today as more folks are paying attention to the training data. But we said, why don't we use a metaphor that we know, like a nutrition label for food? and use it to label a data set so that those who are using the data set know what's in it, just as you might look at the back of a package of cookies to see what's in the cookies before you eat them. Why can't we do that with data? Uh, my art um, is installation art. Uh, this is a walking labyrinth that was about the size of this stage, about five by six meters. And the entire labyrinth is made of questions that are inspired by our relationship to machines. Um, inspired by something Antonio mentioned, the value alignment problem. And I also write children's books. Um, this is a book that hopefully will come out next year. It's called I'm Not a Tomato. And this is inspired by the concept of bias in machine learning. And it's the story of a red round thing that rolls down a mountain and is continuously mistaken for things that it's not along the way. So as you can see here, when it's in tomato town, um, everybody thinks it's a tomato and it's not a tomato. And of course, this has to do with what was in the training data. So you've been hearing from us quite a bit, and now I want to hear from you all. So we're going to do a little exercise. This is a sonification exercise. This is going to require that um, if you have access to your hands, that you use your hands. So the two things we're going to be doing here are snapping. Let's see if folks can, can, you, can everybody snap. Some people have trouble snapping, so if, you, if, you're, if you're not really a good snapper, it's okay, you can just try. Um, you know some people can't snap, but no judgment. And then the other thing that I'm asking you to do is um, rub your hands together. Okay, let's practice. I'm gonna ask you some questions. Snap is for yes, and rubbing your hands together is for no. Uh, is today Monday? This is a practice question. They're going to get a little harder. OK, let's do, let's do one more practice. Is today your birthday? I was hoping we would hear some snaps, but OK, nobody's birthday. Um, OK, great. Let's do some more. Have you used generative AI tools? Will AI have a bigger impact than the internet? Interesting. 
Do you think AI will do more good than harm? <laughs> it's useful to get a sense that this has, that felt very, very mixed. Will AI kill us all? <laughs> good, OK. I'm glad we didn't have a lot of guesses there. All right, now to um, shift tones a little bit. Do you know how to drive a car? Wow, that's almost everybody. Do you know how to fix an engine? Do you know how to ride a bike? Do you know how to build a bike? Some of you may be guessing where this is going. And where it's going is about revisiting our assumptions about the kind of knowledge we need in an order to understand AI. You don't need to be a mechanic in order to drive safely. And you don't need to write code in order to understand, use, or teach with AI. This is really important because I believe that there's some gatekeeping going on. There's a benefit to companies um, making these technologies sound so complex. There's even a benefit to people in the field of computer science, gatekeeping, who can really understand the technologies. And of course, there's different levels of understanding. But to use something safely or to be able to critique it doesn't necessarily require that you know how to build the engine. Um, I think drugs are another, drugs and the use of um, medicines is another really interesting example. We can consume, you know, medicine for a headache or take what our doctor recommends without being a biochemist. We don't need to understand something necessarily at the molecular level in order to make wise, thoughtful decisions about whether we consume it. Even your doctor probably doesn't understand some of these medicines at the, at the molecular level. And the reason I mention this is because we, we talk about the unexplainability of AI, we also talk about the complexity of the, the code, and those things are valuable, and we do want folks who understand the code and who are interrogating the systems. But that doesn't mean that everybody in this room doesn't have the capacity to understand and judge and use these technologies safely and responsibly. And in addition to revisiting our assumptions, we should also question our terms. And the term that I find we use a lot and often without sufficient interrogation is the term artificial intelligence itself. What do we mean when we say artificial? Now, when you think of artificial flowers, and these are artificially generated images by Dali of artificial flowers, I normally think of flowers that are not natural. So the counterpart to artificial is, is not natural. And I think that's often how we're talking about artificial intelligence. It's not natural intelligence. It's some other form of intelligence, right? But there's another meaning of artificial, which is not real. These are not real flowers, not real or fake. These are fake flowers. And so what I want to call into question here is how intelligent these systems are. They're certainly impressive. And they certainly have a lot of data that's underlying them. But intelligence, what do we really mean? And when we say artificial intelligence, do we mean not natural or not real? And I would like you to think about this over the next few days and, and beyond when you're hearing about all these great things that artificial intelligence is doing. One of the things I'll talk about later is that we don't want to give these technologies too much power or attribute too much agency where it doesn't exist. This is very hard to do with large language models because they speak our language. But I hope everybody will continue to question the intelligence of AI systems and approach them both critically and creatively. So that brings me to the AI pedagogy project, which is the project I lead at Harvard. And bringing together the critical and creative is exactly what we're trying to do. Back in 2022, as the large language models and other generative technologies were coming onto the scene, we noticed, I noticed, that my fellow educators were a range of intimidated, overwhelmed, confused, terrified, 
and administrators at the institution were feeling pretty similarly. And yet students were curious, um, intrigued, also concerned, and so I assembled a team of students to um, see if we could put together some resources that would be almost the antidote to the AI hype and the AI overwhelm. It's really overwhelming if you go onto the internet and you try to learn about AI, and yet there's a ton of great stuff out there. And so I assembled a team of students um, to build this resource we just launched in November. I'm gonna show you a little bit of what you might see on the website, and it's wide open, anybody's welcome to use it, and it's, as I said, an antidote to overwhelm, it's very simple, um, sort of sleek, it's not trying to do everything, it's trying to be a starting place. And there's essentially three sections on the site. The about section talks about what we're trying to do. We're geared a little bit more toward higher ed, but we're, you know, it's open for anybody to use. There were a number of K through 12 resources being developed, and we saw fewer things for higher ed, especially things for folks coming out of the liberal arts and social sciences. Um, the about site talks about our team, about our terrific advisors. Then we have this AI guide, and the guide is in three sections. The AI starter is basically an overview. Of what is AI? Again, this is in very plain language, um, accessible to a wide range of folks, really being mindful of the gatekeeping that we saw going on. We talk about the basics of large language models, how they work, some of what they can and can't do, how they're designed, how they're programmed, the kind of trading data that goes into them. There's also a section that's about incorporating AI into your teaching, which I'm gonna talk about shortly. Um, and then a glossary of terms, again, in very accessible language. The site also has a LLM tutorial. LLM is for large language model. We happen to be connected to the API of ChatGPT, but you know, we're agnostic in terms of which model you use. As Mike talked about, there's different affordances with some of the different models and more to come. But this is a tutorial, it's totally open. So if you don't wanna make an account, if you're worried about you know, privacy or that kind of thing, you're welcome to just go to the site and, and use the model. You can chat with it. As you can see here, I was, so on the left-hand side, there's some suggestions of you know, how you might go through it. There's seven stages, and you know, on the right-hand side, this is a screen cap of me asking some questions. Um, let's see what I asked. I think I asked about whether, I was trying to test it. Um, somebody had said that they, uh, it got it wrong when it said, if you, touched, if you touched a pan that was hot yesterday, would you burn yourself? And it said yes, because it missed the word yesterday, because they're not really that intelligent. Um, so I asked it, but it got better, so it got that one right. But you can basically scroll through the tutorial and ask a number of questions, engage with it in different ways, but also learn about things you shouldn't do. For example, not putting in private information, what you, sort of what that means, where the data goes. We also talk about how to opt out of some of the data collection that these, these software companies do. Um, now I'm asking for a history of, the, of Valencia in a, in a four-line rhyming poem. So, you know, they're, they're, you can have fun with them for sure. So there's definitely these, these sort of critical aspects. They're, these models, in addition to all the terrific things that Mike shared around asking it to um, be, moderate a conversation or act as a dialogical partner, they're really good with things that are somewhat formulaic, things like um, rhyming, things like poetry. Basically, they're trained on almost the entire internet. So anything that's on the internet, um, that especially things that follow a certain pattern, they tend to be quite good at. And then I was continuing to have fun with it. I was asking it to explain quantum mechanics to a 10-year-old. And you can see there's a lot to do here. Now, it sounded like most of you have used these systems, so you're probably familiar with some of this. But I find the tutorial to be helpful also in just giving some guidance and parameters of ways you might use it or you might try to use it. Um, and also things that you wouldn't want to share with the model. I was thinking a lot about quantum mechanics this weekend. This will continue. The next section of the site is on um, resources. And what we've done is, again, seeing that there's terrific resources out there, we wanted to be a place to collect some of those resources so people can readily find them. Also, some of the resources that are out there are not very good, so we wanted to make sure to vet things that we think are good and accurate and share those on the site. 
Oh, here I'm asking it about copyrighted information. So I, I've been asked by a lot of educators and artists um, what, what is happening with the copyrighted information that was on the internet. And the truth is, right now, much of it is in there. There are ways to request that your information be taken out of future training data. It's not that easy. And unfortunately, it's not going to be really great for, for copyright. And happy to talk more about that later today. These are the quick start resources I mentioned. And then the bulk of the site is assignments. So these are assignments made by educators around the world who are posting them, say, on Twitter or on their Substacks. And we thought, these are really great assignments that use generative AI both critically and creatively to dovetail with some particular subject matter. So I think here I, I was searching for journalism. And you can find, if you're interested in journalism and how that interacts with AI, you can find an assignment that you can give to your students or you can modify and give to your students that's leveraging the tools in dialogue with these technologies, but doing so not just to celebrate out of hand what the technologies can do, but also ask important questions about what are the risks of these technologies? What are the potential harms of these technologies? And so that the students can be developing AI literacy, which is essential right now, and this is a resource to al allow educators to do that even if they're not experts in AI. And that's our goal here. So I hope some of you will contribute to it. I hope you'll use it and share it with colleagues. We've been doing a number of workshops. Um, we don't have all the countries that are represented here, but in the month of February, we did live workshops, live Zoom workshops, and we had attendees from the countries represented here on this map. So I'm really happy to see the engagement we've seen. One of the things that is so important right now is that this conversation needs to be global. These technologies will affect the world and everybody, and that doesn't always distribute evenly in terms of who benefits and who is harmed. And so global conversation is really essential. And as promised, I'm now going to offer some concrete pitfalls and recommendations for educators right now. I think this complements really nicely what Mike was sharing, because these are things to do as Mike is thinking about what the future that we're creating and what we might anticipate and interesting commonalities with, with the internet. Um, these are some on the ground concrete recommendations that I've developed through my years of experience, but in particular building the AI pedagogy site over the last year, interviewing educators from all over the world, engaging with a lot of students, seeing what's working and what's not working so well. And it's framed as what not to do, but also then, of course, the flip side of what to do instead. I'd also like to acknowledge my collaborator, Jess Yurkovsky, who did the illustrations that you'll see in this next section. Number one, don't Don't put your head in the sand. Do learn the basics. Don't put your head in the sand. Even if you're overwhelmed by AI, as most of us are, the answer is not to avoid it. That is not only impractical, but it's also a disservice to our students. The best way to engage is to learn about these technologies, have some command of them, and then make decisions about how to use them responsibly and how not to use them. Similar to driving, even if you don't like cars, the safest thing to do is not to just pretend they don't exist. That's actually very dangerous. So do learn the basics. Experiment with it. Um, know some resources for yourself, but also places you can point your students to. Think of your own questions. You don't have to be an expert to have really great questions. In fact, in times of great technological change, sometimes the experts are the ones who predict, make the incorrect predictions. And be able to articulate your critiques. If there's something about it that you don't like or doesn't sit well with you, think about that and be able to share that. Have discussions about it, even disagreements. That's really great. Number two, don't, don't give AI too much power. Do know the affordances, and especially know the risks. Choose your metaphors wisely. We, I hear all the time this language around AI that's giving it way too much power about how smart it is, about what it wanted, about what it was trying to do, about how creative it is. 
these things are making people more afraid of this technology, and they're also attributing a sort of intentionality that, that it doesn't have. These technologies have the intentions that are programmed into them. So whatever they're optimized for, that's their intentions. They don't have human intentions. And by being afraid of it, we're giving it too much power. And also by using language uh, that sounds like it has a self is giving it too much power. But they are powerful. But it's good to know in what ways they're powerful. But there's a lot of hype. And not only do companies, I think, have a, you know, benefit from people thinking that these things are so complex they could never understand, also the media hypes this a lot. I mean, the scariest headlines are the ones that are most likely to be clicked on. And we know this. So just be cautious of the hype. And then we won't be able to get into these in a ton of detail right here. But in some of these I've already touched on, but know some of the risks and the affordances. So um, privacy. These things are collecting data. They're collecting the data you put in. They're trained on the data of yours that was on the internet. Um, don't use it for anything that's private. If you want to use it in creative ways, like if you're writing a cover letter or you're getting grammatical help or something like that, I would recommend keep excluding, you know, as in Mike's thing, he had a bracket in it, you know, with the topic there. Try to exclude information that is private. Be careful about names. These companies are collecting all of the data that you give them. Certainly don't put in any personal identifiable information. I think all of us know that. Our rule of thumb is if it's not something you would post on social media, do not put it into a large language model. This also includes content protected by intellectual property, like yours, your unpublished work, your students' work. You probably don't have permission to put it into a large language model. Be very careful about privacy. Bias, the systems have a ton of bias because the internet is biased and is filled with a lot of garbage. And that's what these systems are built on and driven on. So the companies are doing their best to try to mitigate some of that harm. But, they, but the biases still exist in these systems. And there's all kinds of biases. If you think about the past, and you think about some of the human troubles of the past, those biases, those harms, that discriminatory language and behavior and imagery is what's been fed into these models to make predictions about the future. Misinformation, this is probably my biggest concern. The ability for these systems to produce misinformation, undermine democracy, uh, through, you know, whether it's deep fakes or articles that are generated, and Antonio touched on some of this. There's a lot of concern about this. I think one of the mitigation strategies is to be AI literate, to be concerned and critical about how these technologies might produce this misinformation so that we can approach whatever it is that we find online with more skepticism. The incorrect information, I think everybody's familiar with this, it's also known as hallucinations, that these things are not necessarily programmed to be true, they're programmed to sound true or to seem accurate, not to be accurate. That's, those are very different things. The human labor, reinforcement learning with human feedback, which is the method by which a lot of these models are fine-tuned, requires that humans look at some of the content that they're generating and try to, you know, whatever those guardrails are to keep content from being traumatic or offensive, some human has to look at that stuff. And that's one aspect of human labor. And usually those are people that are underpaid in countries that are traditionally poor, that often the technology doesn't serve, um, that are doing the labor to make it um, sort of safe for everybody else to look at. Environmental impacts. Uh, this hasn't been brought up today, and I don't know if educators are thinking about this as much as uh, the environmentalists are, but the environmental impacts are huge. These, these models are extremely energy intensive, um, with water for cooling, with electricity for running them, with the t mining for materials. Uh, there's huge environmental impacts, and I think this is something we really need to be concerned about as we're seeing just the widespread use of these models, just how energy intensive they are. I talked a little bit about copyright, but just the violations of copyright are all over the place. I think artists are concerned about this rightly. And in incre increasing inequities, this is my other probably biggest concern. As much as we say we hope for the democrat democratization of these technologies, as we've seen with most moments of technological change, they tend to first benefit those who are already the most privileged, those who already have the most access, and the narrative is often the opposite. 
So we should be thinking critically about who gets access to these technologies. Right now they're free, but they might, that might not continue to be the case. Who will then be able to afford them? Who has enough internet to, to use the technologies? And what language are the technologies primarily in, and how does that increase inequity? AI con lies continuously and well. I appreciated this quote uh, by Ethan Malik, who's at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Number three. Don't assume your students want to cheat. Do lead with trust. Most students do not want to cheat. If they do, there's a bigger problem. Now, this is hard, but of course, educators are concerned about the ease with which you can use tools to do things that previously would have been impossible, or at least a lot harder. But students have been able to cheat for a long time. Students have been able to pay somebody to do their homework for a long time. If we expect our students to be cheaters, we're not creating an environment where we can learn together about what we're trying to do in the first place. That said, some concrete recommendations. Create a policy. If your school or university or institution does not have a policy, or maybe it leaves it up to the individual educator, create one. Get feedback on it from your students. Discuss why your students are getting an education in the first place and what they want to learn. Revisit your own assumptions about what your role is as an educator. And maybe this is an opportunity for your pedagogy to evolve, to meet the moment. And maybe the kinds of skills that are most useful to teach right now, in addition to things around AI literacy, are also around critical thinking, different kinds of creativity, navigating a world that has a lot of technological tools and doing so responsibly, in addition to whatever your subject matter is. This is uh, an example code of conduct that my team put together with very concrete recommendations. Uh, there's a QR code, uh, it's also on the internet, and here it's a proposed Harvard code of conduct. Actually, Harvard's official code of conduct is a little bit more vague, but uh, they do link to this one, and a lot of educators are using this one. And it has some things even around keeping it updated, that the technology is going to keep changing. So, of course, the rules around the technologies need to keep changing. Also, how maybe short-sighted or unrealistic it is to have a blanket ban on these tools when AI is already integrated to so much of what we do all the time. So, be really specific about where the tools are permitted and where they're not. Asking students to cite or annotate in certain ways. And preparing the students again for the world in which they're graduating into. On, our on the AI pedagogy site, on the resource page, there's also a collection of codes of conduct uh, that my colleague Lance Eaton put together, and it has, I don't know, 50 pages of different codes of conduct from different universities where you can use the language or learn from, leverage it in different ways, so um, you can visit that on the site. Number four, don't trust people who say they know the future. We've always been really bad at predicting the future for all of human history. I don't think that's changing right now. Do approach this technology with, in this moment with humility. As I said, humans have never been able to predict the future accurately, and the experts don't agree about what the AI future holds. The experts are in wild disagreement about what future we have. Um, to, to look forward to. So this is another reason to be humble and be critical about what it is that we're hearing and what future might have in store. Ask questions, ask a lot of questions, and also bring your perspective, but hold your opinions lightly. Be open to being convinced otherwise. And especially if you're new to the field, be ready to learn and change your mind. I love changing my mind. Number five, 
Don't forget who owns the tools. I don't know if you guys recognize here, we have Bill Gates in the middle, that's Mark Zuckerberg on the left, and Elon Musk on the right. Don't forget who owns the tools. These are not tools that were developed in the public interest. These are not public libraries. These are mostly tools right now that were developed by for-profit companies or parts of for-profit companies that are called, calling themselves foundations, but essentially they're for-profit companies. So remain critical and cautious. Companies have different incentives than individuals. Companies have different incentives than educators. And I'm sorry to tell you, but the tools were not developed with your best interest in mind. So be careful how you share your data. And think about how you can use the tools in ways that serve you and your students, because there's ample creative opportunities. And I use these all the time. But do so thoughtfully and do your best to mitigate some of the risks. And that said, don't expect that education won't change. But do question that change. Education has always evolved with the technologies, and that, that's often a good thing. We're not using slide rules anymore. We're not using typewriters. And it's, I love the connection to what Antonio said earlier, the quote from Heraclitus, the only constant is change. So education ought to be evolving. Even who's allowed to be educated has changed even in the last 50 years, and that's still changing and what education looks like, and who, who has the ability to learn, and how they learn. Those are terrific things. But question the change. Which parts of education are the most valuable and relevant now? Which parts are ready to go? Which parts is it, for, which is it time to evolve? So I'm gonna give you a summary, since I went over a lot. Don't put your head in the sand. Don't give it too much power. Don't assume your students want to cheat. Don't trust those who say they know the future. Don't forget who owns the tools. Don't expect that education won't change. Do learn the basics. Do know the affordances and the risks. Do lead with trust. Do approach with humility. Do remain critical and cautious. And do question the change. So to review what I share with you today, and I'm really looking forward to the sessions over the next two days. I hope to meet many of you in your sessions. To review what I just shared with you, I talked about my art. I qu we questioned whether you need to know how to fix a car in order to drive, or whether you need to write code in order to understand or have an opinion about AI. We talked about what artificial intelligence even means. I shared the AI pedagogy resource with you. And then I also offered some tips, including don't put your head in the sand. Don't give it too much power. Don't expect your students want to cheat. Don't trust people who say they know the future. Remember, don't forget who owns the tools. And don't expect that education won't change. And I hope with all of this, you are feeling empowered to face the AI future that's upon us. Thank you.